Welcome everybody to our Lotto class. Now, for those of you who don't know, Lotto stands for Lockout Tagout. This is a standardized procedure for controlling hazardous energy sources. And that is enforced by the OSHA standard for controlling hazardous energy sources, Title 29 Code, Federal Regulation, Part 1910 to 100, or .147, and also 1910.33. Those two govern our Lotto procedures. Uh, why is controlling hazardous energy sources kind of important? Uh, because hazardous energy sources are just that, hazardous. Exactly. We want to control all hazards on site. That's how we keep a site safe. If hazardous energy sources are not properly controlled, you could be exposed to harm and potentially death. And compliance with lockout tagout prevents an estimated of 120 fatalities and 50,000 injuries each year. To any lot of procedure, there are eight basic steps. First is to notify the affected employees. Now on site, that goes up at a higher level. That's gonna be more project management, supervision. That's where you notify everyone, or at least the, the, uh, the affected employees on site of intended, uh, intended action. So this is gonna be before you even start the, the work. This is gonna be days prior, up to even a day prior. Now this is gonna be for anything that's gonna affect anyone. Say you're taking out a circuit to a hot plate and someone needs to use that hot plate. You need to notify them that it's not gonna be operable while it's being maintained or installed. That way they don't go to switch it on and start to wonder, okay, why isn't this working? And then go to explore and try to turn it on in some fashion that isn't safe. That's the whole point behind notifying people so no one's surprised. On the second step, you're going to identify the procedure. Now to do that, you need to understand the energy type. Is it gonna be thermal, hydraulic, mechanical, or energy? Now once you've identified which one, and we're gonna go for forward assuming electrical, you wanna understand the magnitude. So that's gonna be what kind of voltages and powers you're gonna be dealing with. That will allow you to understand what kind of precautions that you're going to have to take whenever going forward. Now that's going to entail the energy hazards. So you're gonna understand like, uh, for instance, if you're going into a panel, you're gonna be dealing with high volts of electricity. So that's gonna be where this arc flash kit comes in handy. Now that's going to be there, to, that's going to be a method of reducing hazards. Now in shutting down the equipment, that's when this is going to come into play because you want to, especially with an electrical panel, avoid arc flash injuries, which, is going, which has a high probability because you have so much exposed metal inside the panels. Now steps, you wanna take the steps required to identify the power sources. Now maybe not all of the connections inside the panel are going to be modified or, ma or require maintenance. So whenever you go into it, you wanna to try to tag as you're going through the items that you're gonna be working on so you don't make any mistakes and you know what to stay clear of and what needs to be shut off so you don't interfere with something that's not intended because that would be going outside of our notification. Now, the proper press shutdown procedures, like in our exhibit over here, can be as simple as switching it to the off position. Now that's off. That means the rest of the circuit behind that is going to be safe, but before you do that, you wanna make sure that the point of work, you're gonna test with one of these to make sure that all the power is eliminated. You don't have any leak through voltage, or maybe the shutdown didn't shut off the circuits in, in properly or entirely because of some unknown error or misstep whenever it was installed. You wanna to try to prepare for all these instances. That's why we do the check before we work. And to isolate the energy sources, we typically can unplug or turn off so in isolating the machine or equipment from the source by using energy isolating devices, that would be like a, a circuit interrupter, a GFI, as uh, to common speak, a ground fault interrupter. Now that comes into play whenever you're using something like an extension cord, maybe your grinder overdraws energy, or maybe the bandsaw has a break in the cord and starts to take on too much voltage. Instead of having that hit the line or pull too much and then shut down the system, a GFCI would be there to isolate the energy source whenever you take too much and it shuts off that connection completely. Now applying lotto devices. This can be pretty straightforward, but also has some intric intricate details here. Now, when you go to shut off one breaker, pull it down. This is after all your verifications. To apply this, you have to open it up. And then whenever you put it on there, you wanna screw it down so it sits nicely, nice and snug. 
That allows this to put pressure so it can't be taken off easily. Now on these single ones, you can typically use one of these U-line locks. When the key is out, can't open it. Key has to be in, now it opens. Slide it through the hole. Now it's locked out and I have the key, so no one but me can remove it. Now, say the work takes more than one circuit. Now we're going to apply it, a couple of them. This lock will also work on two of them at, a sa at the same time. Yes, I'll put it off. And it'll go through both holes just like that. Same procedure, take the key out. Now it's locked out, can't be opened because I have the only key. Now we're starting to come out with these other methods because this won't go for more than three. Over here, we have a three. Put these two on. Now this, this is a little different than your standard lock. It doesn't have the typical bend over, it's a straight line. So this has a little nip, nip or a, a bit at the end that keeps it from coming out from one side. Whenever I have the key out, it can't come out. Key in, it comes out. Then all you gotta do is slide it through all three locks. Now you have all three locks locked out. Now if you don't have these tightened out, what can happen? I can just pull all this off. Now this doesn't matter anymore. That's why it's important whenever you go to put these on to always tighten them down. That way they actually stay on what you're intending, intending them to stay on. Now tag out is, the, is also a typical part of your average lockout tag out procedure. That's the last name. These have to be securely fastened to whatever you're tagging out. Now this can be if, uh, reached with either uh, zip ties, uh, steel wire, or even putting them on the lock if you have enough room. That way everything is together. Now this is to inform those that are coming over to the panel, okay, this is locked out. You're not allowed to unlock this. Who locked it out and why? And there are entries on here, expect a completion date, so when it can be expected to be released. Uh, the department that locked it out, typically electrician, but in case you have mechanical or other fields, those also apply. And you also want the name of those who locked it out. That way, if you need to get into it or need to talk to someone about that circuit in particular, maybe it's shutting off something that wasn't intended, you can contact them and inform them, hey, there's an issue here. This is all about maintaining communication and making sure you can contact the appropriate parties as efficiently as possible. It's the whole point behind lockout tagout, to make it safe and make it efficient. So now what to do after we've applied our lockout tagout devices. We want to release our controlled, or we want to verify that all stored energy is released. Now, this is a term that's a bit of a blanket term, so that way it can cover both mechanical, hydro, or hydraulic, thermal, and electrical. That basically just means that you want to verify that the system doesn't have any voltage behind it if you're dealing with electrical. And for any other system, it's a verification that the contents aren't under pressure and won't and aren't going to affect your work, that it is in a safe condition. Now, when dealing with electrical, this device is handy because you want to go to the source of your work and after you've turned it off, you shouldn't have anything showing up on here. It should be dead. Now, if you do still have a voltage, that's what this whole verification process is for. Because if you started working on that and you still had voltage behind it and didn't know it, that's an even more dangerous situation because you're under the false pretense of safety. Now, that can be more dangerous than most any situation because you're not going to be as careful as you would be if you had it in mind, though, okay, this is live. You're going to probably touch it with metal at some point or another. It's almost a guarantee. That's why whenever you do these safety measures, you want to verify every time that it is, in fact, not operational, that it is safe to work on. I want to add something real quick to this, because there's specific tests, um, but we definitely want you to also check. So you check leg to leg. So if you're used to using a multimeter, you check for voltage from leg to leg, but you also need to do leg to ground tests. Because you, if you may have one leg that's fully disconnected and another leg that is not fully disconnected, unless you confirm leg to ground, uh, on each leg of power, whether it's, um, whether it's single phase or whether it's um, single phase 240 or whether it's three phase, um, checking the ground is a good final safety test. Now again, that's assuming that you have a good ground where you're checking too. So uh, so if you're in like a really rusty or corroded assembly, you may want to check a couple places uh, just to make sure. But uh, 
don't even just check. People will say trust your meter, but you don't even just trust your meter. That's where you're using things like non-contact voltage uh, detection in addition to a good quality voltmeter um, is, is the way to go. And I know some of this stuff sounds like overkill, but um, I, I, I've come from the field where I've been shocked many times even after checking leg to leg, uh, only to realize that I only have one leg disconnected. Now that you verified that your circuit is not going to harm you, that everything is safe, that you've done your lockout tag out properly, you want to go over the equipment that you're going to be using whenever you're going to actually do the maintenance. Now, this arc flash gear and fire extinguisher. Why? Just because if we do, in fact, have an arc flash incident, something might catch on fire. You want to be able to put it out immediately. ABC fire extinguishers are good for this, and there is also electrically oriented fire extinguishers just for that. I personally like the ABCs because you never know what kind of fire you're going to end up starting. You might as well full, go full spectrum. Now, also, what are you going to be getting in this arc flash kit? So in this, you'll have a bag. In this bag. So in this bag, you're going to have a hard hat with a shield. Now, this is going to protect your face from any sparks or debris that may come up from an arc flash event. The hard hat, it's all also electrically neutral, so it's not going to conduct anything. You've also got your fire retardant uh, gear. This is going to be the jacket that you're going to be putting on. This simply just goes on you. Oh, Want to be my dummy? Yeah. No <laughs> it's big enough, I promise. And you'll also get these. It's a bit like overalls. Cool. Good point. Thank you. Now you also get this head covering. This is also a fire retardant head covering. That'll protect the unprotected areas from this face shield. Say it goes and bounces around the small metal box that you're in. It's gonna come at you from all angles. That's what that is there for, to keep you from getting uh, what I've always had referred to as dragon kisses from appearing on your neck. They hurt, especially when you start sweating, trust me. It sparks whenever they hit you. <laughs> And, and last but not least, gloves. Now, if you'll notice, this is a rubber glove inside of a leather glove. This provides both electrical protection and protection from sharp objects that will be inside of the panel, such as any, uh, any exposed wires, anything left over, sharp edges inside the box. You don't want that rupturing your glove and causing an electrical contact to your skin. Cool. Now he's ready for, <laughs> to go inside of a panel. So the verification portion is basically whenever you go to your workstation, where you're going to be working at, and you're going to test it. You're going to try to turn it on. You want to make sure that nothing happens. That's a final verification after you've, you've uh, recognized that there's no more energy behind it. This is in case there's any other supplies to it. We're, this is to verify on any instance that you've done everything you possibly can to make sure that this equipment is shut down. So you've gone to the breaker, but what if there is a secondary flow of energy? Sometimes this happens, depends on which site you're going to, depends on where you're at, but it does happen. Say you have a backup generator and you have a third wire in there, you may, might mistake it for a ground wire, but it's really leading to a backup source of energy that might kick on as soon as you lock out this panel. So what you think is off because you verified it after you've shut it off could potentially get turned back on by this backup power. Thus, you wanna turn it on before you start anything to verify that this is sure and truly off and safe to work on. Now, and bringing the equipment back online, which is step eight, it's basically the reversal of all the other processes. After you've gone through, done your maintenance, you wanna make sure that it is clear of all tools. It is clear of all personnel. Anything that you brought there is gone. You wanna make it look like you've never been there. That is whenever you're clear to start taking off your lockout tag out. Get the persons that applied the lockout tag out and once you've got your lockout tag out taken off, you'll turn the breakers back on, and that's whenever you can test the equipment again to make sure that there's an energy flow. And then you go to the activation stage where you try to operate the equipment. That is the final operation stage because if it doesn't turn on, you've made a misstep in the other steps that you've tried to recreate and reverse. And it's as simple as back tracing. Okay, have I taken everything off that I've gone through, that I've put on? Do I have an extra key still in my pocket from a breaker I haven't taken off somewhere else? And then once you've verified that everything is taken off and the device is working properly, that's the end of lockout tag out. Over time, your lockout tag out, tag out procedures may change. OSHA offers a baseline of lockout tag out and the company provides the procedure. So over time, that's why you see minor changes. 
And over this past year, I'm sure that you've seen the minor changes come about. Even these locks are starting to become new because before we had these wire locks that we would fit through. These are a lot better, I think at least. It allows a lot less clutter and allow and disallows for one of those, uh, say you have a breach in the rubber coating on that wire that you don't know about. It's inside of an electrical panel. That's all sorts of hazardous, whereas this is much shorter, much more clean, efficient, and it's easy to take off, most of all. And it's also important to make sure that you keep your teams aware of any changes. So say uh, I came to your site and I informed you, okay, whenever we do these panel checks, this is how it's supposed to be written in properly. If you don't allow your team to know this, you're gonna continuously have problems. So keep your team notified. That goes to team leads or even um, a single electricians that have found this out from another job site and it hasn't quite reached this one. Let people know. If you see it wrong, let them know. And everybody has the opportunity to call uh, a cease on any of these operations if they see something unsafe. If they're doing something improperly, you have the authority to make it known, make someone aware. Say you see the electrician's name, you can go up to him and say, hey, I don't think this was done properly. I've seen it done this way at a store and this is why. Now, if you're missing that this is why, you can't tell them for any certain reason why they should do it this way, because you don't know yourself. You just did it at another store. See where understanding comes into importance. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.